You guys, please be seated. Well, today is the third and the final in the series that I entitled The Abundant Life, coming from John 10, 10, where he says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have that more abundantly. And as we discussed at the outset, that abundant life is not to be confused with with mere prosperity, okay? Abundant life is a lot more than just than money or things. In fact, it's mostly about things that cannot possibly be purchased by money. God, yes, God blesses, God gives favor, God gives abundance, he does all that. But we're talking about something a little different. Abundant life manifests in us as peace, joy, emotional health, mental strength, consistent faith, and perseverance. Abundant life manifests through us as Holy Spirit empowerment and supernatural favor that brings influence and fruit for the kingdom of God. The abundant life is a byproduct of the lordship of Jesus in every area of life. Whatever has been brought fully under the authority of the king experiences the benefits of the kingdom reign, right? And wherever we resist the Lord's lordship, where we, where we hold back, that remains subject to the world and to its principles. We're called to live abundant life, a life of joy, but we're also called to live in and by the Holy Spirit. We're called to live a life where, frankly, as the scripture says, we're seated in heavenly places. I talked to you guys about having one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. And that's where we are, seated in heavenly places, connected to heaven's power, heaven's voice, heaven's supply, heaven's authority. So a big part of that vibrant, abundant life is living a supernatural life that's empowered by the Spirit, not just operating with your natural mind or your natural abilities, but with things that have been imparted, have been imparted to you by the Holy Spirit. We're not just living by our wits or by the talents we were born with or by our brains, but we're living with things that have been imparted to us by the Holy Spirit. We hear God's voice. Yeah, a few more, a few more amens, please. We hear God's voice, right? We are led by faith. We have abilities that we did not have before we knew the king. And we sometimes call these abilities um, grace gifts or spiritual gifts. And Paul talks in several passages of scripture extensively about spiritual gifts. Romans 12, Ephesians chapter 4, very extensively in 1 Corinthians. So I'm going to take a little bit of time, because it, there's a reason for this, to look at what he has to say, beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because he begins it with these words, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Some of the versions say, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now that's really fascinating, because in the very first chapter of the same letter, he tells these guys in verse 7, you are not lacking any spiritual gift. He literally tells them that as a church, they have every spiritual gift in operation in their midst. And now, later in this same letter, he says, I don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant of gifts. Now, I'm not all that clever, but that tells me something. It tells me that Christians can have Holy Spirit imparted gifts and at the same time be unaware or uninformed or ignorant about the purpose and operation of those very gifts they have. It's one thing to have a spiritual gift, it's another to know how to operate in it. So now let's drop down to verse 7. To each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common goods. Good. Who gets spiritual gifts? Each one. You got one, if you're his. At least one. And why are they given? For the common good. Oh, You see, that means that if I have a gift in my life, it's not for me. It's not so I can build an Instagram following. It's not. Not for I make a buck. It's for your benefit. If you have a gift in your life, it's for my benefit. Our gifts are for each other. It's how God put this body of Christ together. Spiritual gifts and their supernatural operation are others-focused. Rick Warren began his best-selling book, Purpose Driven Life, years ago with this radical phrase, it's not about you. (laughs) 
And I think it was a shock to a lot of people in this generation. Really? <laughs> because so much, all right, I'm metal just a little bit here. So much of the church world in my lifetime has been about, okay, getting my needs met. And churches scramble to make people as comfortable as possible and sometimes as entertained as possible. And Rick said something really important in that work. He said, it's not about you. And you're never going to live to see the abundant life by being focused on your own needs and your own problems and your own issues. You're never going to get there. And what I want you to see today is that the more we learn to focus on others and love them, the more abundant life we will experience. So Paul's talking about all these gifts here in 1 Corinthians 12. To one is given the spirit of the utterance of wisdom, another the utterance of knowledge, another faith by the same spirit, another gifts of healing, another working of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, spirits, various kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by the one and the same spirit, apportioned as he wills. So after he talks about these then he goes on to talk about how we humans often perceive our own role and our own gift in the church as being more important than the others and the other gifts. And he says in verse 14, for the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be less a part of the body. And the ear, if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not make it less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged in the body each one as he chose. And then in verse 21, he says this, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor the hand to the feet, or the head to the feet, I don't need you. Now, why in the world would Paul say such a bizarre thing? Here's why. Because spiritual gifts are given to people. I'm full of spiritual revelation like this this morning. Just stick with me. He gives them to people, and that is exactly what we do. I mean, in my lifetime, I've kind of watched people like people who tend to have a teaching gift in their life. They're like, yes, we need to get with the context and understand the word. And I, I get it, because that's kind of the way I lean. And, and, and then... then over here, the prophet's looking at him and going, brother, you need to get with the spontaneous move of the spirit. Come on. And the, and, and the teachers look at the prophet and going, you're a flake. <laughs> right? And it's easy to see everything in the body from our perspective. It's important to remember that spiritual gifts are not awards. They're not a sign of how spiritual you are. They're not a sign of how much you already look like Jesus. They're not your natural ability. They're a charis. They're, they're charismata. They're really the great manifestations of grace is one way you could translate that. They are they're just gifts given by a gracious God so that you and I can serve one another in the body with pleasure and effectiveness. Amen. And so here in chapter 12, he tells us this and he goes on to mention... Apostles and prophets and teachers and words of wisdom and words of knowledge and gifts of healing and miracles and helps, prophecy tongues, interpretation of tongues, all of these for the various common good. And then <laughs> he says in verse 31, I love this one, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. In fact, if you look at the Greek, you could easily translate that, zealously lust after now, most of my life I heard this, brother, seek the giver, not the gift. And that sounds really spiritual, except it's unbiblical. Because he actually said, to seek the gifts. So we're supposed to seek the giver all the time and seek to operate in spiritual gifts, right? And Paul spends this entire chapter talking about this divine empowerment for Christians and he tells us to seek the higher gifts. And then the last line that we read here in what we know as chapter 12 is, and now I will show you a more excellent way. The expression is hyperbole hodos, a much higher road, pathway, much more effective. And what is this much more vastly effective methodology of spiritual gifts? Because that is the topic, right? Next, we read these words. 
If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What? Why did Paul suddenly shift and start talking about marriage? He didn't. He didn't. He's still talking about spiritual gifts. You see, chapter 12 is about spiritual gifts. Chapter 14 is about spiritual gifts. And believe it or not, chapter 13 is about spiritual gifts. He's not talking about romantic love. Now keep in mind, the chapter divisions weren't there when Paul wrote it. Those chapter divisions are their great idea. Chapters and verses were added generations later. In fact, the chapters were added in 1205, more than 1100 years after Paul writes this stuff. And the first verses numbering was actually done in 1551 by a printer in Paris. Yep, that's not old at all. And they're very useful, but it's kind of important when we're reading the scripture and we're wanting to understand it. And when we come to that chapter division, it didn't necessarily mean that the author's changing topics. So Paul is being purposeful here and now talking about love in a conversation about our spiritual ability. He's giving us a key to empowering the supernatural abundant life. He's telling us what makes the spiritual gifts work. Now when Paul uses the word love here, he's talking about a very specific type of love. And it's worth repeating to you guys, for those of you who know it, He's using the Greek word agape. The ancient Greeks, we, we have a one word in English. We use the word love. But the Greeks had multiple words. And there's four very common ones. Eros, which is where we get our word erotic. It refers to sexual love or romantic love. There was storge, which is um, the type of love that's like familial love. Love or a father for a son. You know, mother for a daughter. Um, then, then phileo is a different kind of word. It's, it's, it's where we get our word uh, more of a brotherly love, love between brothers. It's, most people consider it the highest type of love that humans generally operate in, you know, the kind of you know, love you have for your fellow man. But then agape, wow, that's the most interesting word for love. Agape is a love that doesn't diminish, it doesn't erode, it doesn't change. It is sold out, it is selfless, it is complete, it's self-giving, and it doesn't demand anything in return. It's a love so unique that it can be poured out freely upon even the most unlovable and the most ugly. Amen. It's a love so deep that it doesn't stop when it's totally rejected. It gives because it loves. It does not love in order to be loved. Agape is completely self-sacrificial and giving. It's the kind of love that does not consider self. And actually, agape has much less to do with emotion than it has to do with self-denial for the sake of another. Paul is telling us this vastly higher, better road to experience supernatural, abundant life and our empowered spiritual gifts. It is selfless, focused agape. Amen. Now, with the thought of that kind of love in mind, Listen to these words. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and I have not agape, I'm a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Those words there, <clears throat> noisy gong and clanging cymbal, are two Greek expressions that actually come from the Greek theater word. You know, Greeks loved theater. And they had this thing that, 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 uh, that what, the word here is kalkos ekon, which the noisy gong, which is, it was actually a... We would almost call it like an echo chain. It was a brass echo device. Um, any of you musicians know what a reverb plate is, something like that. That's basically what it was in the old days. But they used it like backstage you would have this funnel. And if someone was simulating like the voice of Zeus, they would speak into the funnel and it would give this big booming reverb, okay? And when he talks about the, the clanging cymbal, the expression there comes to the kumbalum, which was a device that was used, they would hit it when they wanted like, to make the sound of thunder, like, you know, the gods throwing the thunderbolt or whatever. That was what they did. So, what's Paul saying? He's saying, if I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but I'm not motivated by agape, I am playing a role. I'm not the real thing. I'm the actor playing the role as opposed to the actual person. Amen. Yeah. 
And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and all faith, if I can remove mountains, but I don't have agape, nothing. If I give away everything I have and I deliver my body to be burned and have not agape, I gain nothing. So it doesn't really matter how profound my gift is or how much I grow in the operation of it. I can be the greatest prophet in the land and if I'm not driven by a sense of selfless love for others, I'm nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love waits. It knows God has this deal and in the end it's all going to be good. And so it expresses itself in kindness. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant, rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices at the truth. You could say it this way. Love doesn't care who gets the credit. Love is very happy to let other people take the credit. It doesn't need somebody to say, good job. It's not self-focused. It doesn't need to feel good about itself. Love gives because it loves to give. Love is not arrogant. Love does not insist on its own way. You know, there's another passage in uh, Romans chapter 12 where Paul again talks about spiritual gifts. And it's not an accident that there he says, outdo one another in showing each other honor. It's fascinating. Love is not irritable or resentful. Most of the times you read that word resentful, it actually translates it this way. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Ooh, remember that. Love keeps no record of wrongs. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So again, Paul is teaching us on agape to tell us what empowers God's spiritual gifts in our lives. What actually makes them work. It is not about us. It's about others. And agape, selfless love, is the gasoline that powers the engine of the Holy Spirit. It's a doorway to an abundant life of living in joy and abundance that most, most people never know. Like all these reciprocal principles we've talked about in the last few weeks, give and it will be given. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Selfless love responds by giving you back a reward in your soul that no man can ever take away. Galatians 5, 6 says, for in Christ there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but faith working through love. The old King James said it this way, faith worketh by love. The energy supply to faith is agape. Your higher levels of faith are not energized by your external sign of spirituality or how hard you work or your religious observance, or your piety, but it is energized by agape. Pistis de agape energio. Literally, faith is energized by agape. Faith is empowered by selfless giving love. And unlocking miracle working faith is a function of operating in agape. I mean, have you noticed how many times The Bible speaks of Jesus' compassion immediately before healing takes place. Let's look at a few. Matthew 14. He went ashore, he saw a great cow, had compassion on them, and healed their sick. Next chapter, Matthew 15. Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion on the crowd. They have been with me three days now, have nothing to eat. He multiplied the loaves and fishes. In Mark, we read the same thing. He had compassion on them, and he healed them. I can give you example after example after example. I won't take the time. But he had compassion and he healed. In other words, it was the miracle working power of our Savior was activated by the same selfless love that compelled him to go to the cross for you and me. A love so deep that he gave all. A love that looked at the unlovely and loved deeper still. Agape love is the currency of the kingdom. Now, I've already taught quite a bit this year on the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the prayer he gave for us disciples. And Jesus asked us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I, I pointed out that really, I think some of the best exegesis of that that I've read 
points out that it, it really, in the, the, the terminology there, when he says, your kingdom come, you will be done, it's not like, oh, Lord, please let your kingdom come. It's more like this, kingdom come, will of God be done. It's an agreement between us and the will of the Father, and we're, we're participating and cooperating with that, okay? On earth as it is in heaven is actually everything that Jesus modeled for us on earth and what he practiced. When we saw Jesus, we saw the Father, We learned who the Father is like by looking at Jesus. And really, the world is supposed to learn what heaven is like by how we demonstrate God's ways. How do they know God is gracious and compassionate if we are not? Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those. You know, here we are. We ask for his kingdom to come. We ask for his supernatural supply. And in the next sentence, we are declaring and assuring the heavenly father that we forgive in the same way he forgives us. And, and by the way, in the very next verse, after Jesus says that, he says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive them, you won't be forgiven. Now, it is not an accident that Jesus told us about the kingdom coming and his will being done and heaven meeting earth and all the things we dream of seeing happening. And in the next sentence, he tells us we got to forgive. You think that's an accident? I don't. Because I think the biggest obstacle to his kingdom manifesting and his will being done on earth is our shortage of agape. It's our unwillingness to love and forgive the miserable, rotten world around us. And that is what keeps the peace and the joy and the awakening that is your kingdom come. It's us staying in a state of offense. It is us being a victim. Us being hurt. Us being angry. Us not forgiving. That withholds the abundant life we've been talking about. I've been thinking about this a lot. I, you know, and I think that most of us here, we believe what God's word says about forgiveness. We know we got to forgive. We can't hold on to bitterness. It just hurts us. We've had that teaching. We have a doctrine of forgiveness. We have a policy of forgiveness. But are we walking in a spirit of readiness for forgiveness whereby we live? I said to you guys a couple of weeks ago that historically this is kind of how we work through forgiveness. Here's the pattern. Like, usually for the first few hours, I'm steamed pretty bad, right? And then in the next couple of days, I might tell one or two people, you know, just one or two, right? And then in you know, the middle of the third day, I'm kind of working through it, giving it to Jesus. And after a couple of weeks, I'm good. And I feel really good about how I forgive people. <laughs> but see, I'm being challenged by the Holy Spirit. To raise the bar of forgiveness and start keeping a record of no wrongs. When Jesus was being betrayed by Judas, he called him friend. It wasn't days later, it was in the midst of the betrayal. And then Jesus was arrested and then the Romans took that flagellum, that whip with all those strands and the little bits of lead on the end that are designed to dig into the flesh and they beat him again and again and again until there was no skin on his back and by most people's reckonings it's very likely his internal organs were actually exposed at this point he had his beard pulled out of his face he was hit they spit on him they mocked him They pushed thorns as a crown down on his head. And then then they released a murderous criminal instead of him. The crowd cried out to release him instead of the one who had healed their children. And then they drove nails into his hands and to his feet. And while they were doing it, he prayed, Father, forgive while they were doing it. And then they hung him between two thieves. 
And if you read all the gospel accounts, it sort of appears like in the beginning, maybe both of the thieves mocked him, and then one of them was eventually conscience-stricken and began to rebuke the other and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And in the moment, Jesus immediately looked at him there in the pain of the cross and said, you'll be with me today in paradise. In the middle of the injustice, he's giving grace. In the middle of the injustice, he's giving grace. And he's on the cross, he's saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And you look at that and you think, well, wait a minute, they didn't know what they were doing. They knew they were crucifying an innocent man. They knew they had just released a murderous thug and, and, and were crucifying him instead. They knew about Jesus' reputation, his ministry, his works. He had been around in that city. He had been in that region for three and a half years. They knew about the people he had raised from the dead. It hadn't been long since he had raised Lazarus. Everybody was talking about it. They knew about the food that had been multiplied. They had followed him around. They had applauded his message. They knew all of that. And yet from Jesus' perspective, they still didn't know enough. They didn't really know. I mean, they were sinful people. They were born into a sinful world. They needed a savior. And so he said, forgive them. They don't get it. They they don't know what they're doing. None of us really do. So I'm asking myself, and I ask you, think about this test. If somebody hurts you, when somebody is deliberately ugly to you, when you have been wounded, when you've been disrespected, when you've been hurt, when you've been lied about, how long does it take you to forgive them? My suggestion is we learn to do it quickly. Be like Jesus. Stop wasting time. Don't keep a record of wrong. If we keep records of wrong, all we're going to ever do is write. Records. We're going to become professional record writers. By the way, I was preparing this message, and this week I got one of those tests. I had somebody, you don't know, far away in another city, but somebody I've done a lot of things for. And that person just like really hit me upside the head, hurt me this week. And as soon as it was done, I'm I'm like, I'm still in communication with them, and I'm going, yeah, I know. i got to drop it right now. There's no reason to waste a minute on this thing. I just can't waste any time because I want to live the abundant life. I want to experience what Jesus has got. God for me. So you just release it. How do you do it? Well, I love what Hebrews 12 says about this. And I think about this one a lot. And this this is a tool for me, it works. Where he says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now, I've taught on bitterness before and talked about how it's it's like like an evil weed that grows in the heart. The heart is such fertile soil for it. And bitterness, you hold on to, it starts to grow. And once it grows, you know, it wants to spread from heart to heart to heart as you, as you, as you just share with one person about what's happened, right? And it begins to spread. And that's what we do. And yet it says it defiles many. But notice what he says here. See to it that none of you miss the grace of God. Ah, you see, when, we're think, when we are looking at his grace and the fact that it was my sin that caused him to get that beating... It was my sin that put him on the cross. When we think what he did for us and the incredible grace that he's poured out to us, how do we, how do we get mad about that? Amen. So we view his grace to us, and it has a way of just liberating us from bitterness and helps us not take into account the wrong suffered. And, and that means I'm not keeping a record so next time I can bring it up to you and put you in your place and let you know what you've done wrong. Amen. By the way, forgiveness is never about saying what the other person did was okay. It's never about saying that that wasn't sin. And it's certainly not about giving them permission to do it again. I mean, if somebody has stolen money from you, Forgiveness doesn't mean you need to loan them your bank card, okay? Forgiveness means I'm no longer holding on to what you have done as an offense. It's releasing the offense so that it no longer has a hold on you. It's recognizing this world is so full of sin, 
we can't possibly keep record writing. And when I forgive somebody, here's what happens. I'm no longer the victim. I am now the victor. I am no longer controlled. Nor do I seek to control them. The chain that held a link between us is gone because I forgave. So there's no hold either way. I'm not controlling them. They're not controlling me. And I am not manipulated anymore by someone's evil designs. And that freedom brings a harvest in your soul of joy, peace, and abundance. The abundant life is a life that chooses to abide in a place of love. It chooses to forgive because in that there is a release of miracle working power. If you want to know the abundant life, know this. Love and forgiveness are among your greatest weapons. Your greatest weapon, and by the way, your greatest weapon also has a real impact on eternity. As Paul said in Romans 12, I mentioned before Romans 12 is also about spiritual gifts. As far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Wow. He's basically saying that at any minute, be ready to strategically deploy your weapon of forgiveness. Be strategically ready for the sake of the kingdom to let it go, to seek peace, and to protect your relationships with people. And you may be thinking, well, how do I grow in love? Ha. Ah, mm. Well, that's the thing about it. You can't try any harder and love more. It doesn't work like that. Love is a fruit of the Spirit. Which means you have to get in His presence and let Him transform you. As I've shared quite a bit already in this series of like 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, as we behold Him, we're transformed into that image. The key to all of this stuff is that we become what we behold and that comes down to being with Jesus. And by being with him, we start to become like him. And then we begin to do the things that he does. The abundant life is lived by people who have surrendered hearts. Who make Jesus their king. And if we're willing to surrender our frustrations and our anger and our disappointments and all of these things to the king and love and give ourselves selflessly, you will discover a return of joy and abundance in your soul that most people on this earth will never know. Would you stand with me? Jesus was by the Sea of Galilee after his resurrection. There was Peter who had betrayed him. Peter who'd said, Lord, I love you more than everybody. I'll never betray you. There he is, the betrayer. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? And what you should know that you don't read about in the English is that he says, Peter, do you agape me more than these other guys? And Peter said, Lord, you know I phileo you. I love you in a brotherly sort of way. And so Jesus says to Peter again, uh, Peter, do you agape me? Peter said, uh, well, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. I'm agape? Mm, I, I love you like a brother. And the third time Jesus asked the question, you know what he says in the original Greek? He says, do you really phileo me? Do you really love me like a brother? Jesus had stopped using the word agape. And he's calling Peter on it. And here's the answer. Peter, you don't even really love me like a brother. You don't even really have that, do you? And that's why Peter grieved and he cried. But then Jesus looked at that same Peter and he said these words. Feed my sheep. Here's the message. You're not there. You don't have that kind of love. I don't have that kind of love. But he still gave us the whole thing. He gave us the keys to the kingdom. He gave us the privilege of bearing his name. He gave us the privilege of growing in him, learning in him, walking with him, becoming more like him. He gave us that. And he said, look, go out of these walls and transform the world around you. The power I've given to you, the authority I've given to you, the calling I've given to you, the empowerment, all of that is in place. Believe me, feed my sheep. Don't worry about the worthy part. I, you're not. Just deal with it. I mean, literally, that's the message. So if you're here today and you're going, oh, man, I fall so short in this love, so does everybody else in this room. 
that doesn't mean we don't press in to the king. Bow your heads with me. If you're here this morning, you say, look, I, when you're talking about this forgiveness stuff, I just immediately thought of a couple of situations or a situation that I got to let go of. Just as a sign of faith and saying, Lord, I want to give that up. I just want you to raise your hand this morning. Yeah, okay. Of course, I want to encourage you today as we're closing to just come down and find somebody here in front and just pray with you briefly because it's kind of a step of faith. If you're here this morning and you know that you really need to make Jesus the king of your life, he's not ruling your life. You're not spiritually where you need to be and you know it. I'm going to also invite you as we're closing this morning, just seek someone here to pray. That's why, why we do this at the close of services. We've got people down here. We want to be able to pray for you. If you need just a word of encouragement from the Lord, you know what? We'll believe the prophetic gift will be in operation and there'll be a gift of word of encouragement for you today, right here, right now. If you're sick in your body, you need a healing touch from the Lord, we want to do some body ministry this morning and just going to invite you to be a part of it. In the meantime, let me say to you, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his favor rest upon you. I bless you in the name of the Lord and remind you that his spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He has made alive your mortal body. He's called you and empowered you everywhere you go to bring influence for the kingdom, to be the encourager. Step out this week and do it. Amen? I'm going to head to the lobby to greet you as you leave. In the meantime, let's worship. Amen.